show or if you're here for the first time you get a big welcome as well this is where we find learn and play one more turn of the great strategy games and we have got a treat because we have an advanced copy of war in the east 2 once again thank you to slytherin and matrix for providing this uh, I know I've got a big contingent of Gary Grigsby fans here, and so I'm glad that you guys get to see the game. Uh, Pre-order it on their site. It is only available on the Matrix website at uh, launch, and so you can go there and find it. Well, I kind of went back and forth about what I was going to do, but uh, you know what? Let's just jump in and play the game. Uh, so we're going to do a Let's Play. Let's Play Part 1 is this episode so we are really going to start right from the start and try to figure out the game the best we can now i this may not be quite as smooth as my war in the east uh one let's play because hey look I, there's going to be some things i'm trying to figure out you're trying to figure out i'll be trying to explain then i'll say wait a minute i think it you know I played a lot of War in the West. I played a lot of War in the East 1. I think we can figure it out. So let's just jump in and play. That's what people want to see. They don't want to hear me talking about airfields and stuff like that. Although we will be doing a lot of talking about airfields. <laughs> so uh, pre-warnings there. Hey, CJ. Thanks for stopping by. Um, but yeah, we're just going to jump in here. We're going to play the Axis. Uh, the Soviet, then the Soviets are being played by the computer. I'm going to keep this on normal for the first playthrough, okay? Uh, you know, let's not challenge ourselves too much. I'm sure we will be challenged plenty. Uh, so the Soviets, uh, you see here, computer controlled. I am gonna turn on fog of war for this playthrough and movement fog of war. If you're not familiar with what that is, it not only doesn't show you the units uh, just out in the hinterlands uh, automatically, you have to do recon over them. Movement Fog of War also will not show you anything past Soviet controlled, the first Soviet controlled hex. So you can't see how far you could move. You can't exactly see what's, you know, back there once you do. You go up to the Soviet controlled hex, you stop there, and then you start moving hex by hex as you get into Soviet territory. Lock headquarters support, we are not going to do that. I looked over the support units. They are handled generally the same way. Uh, now, there is a little more flexibility with those because some of the support units uh, are what they call kind of multi-use, multi-purpose. You can actually turn them into counters on the board. We'll get into that. That's not a turn one thing that we're going to be doing. I am going to put on automate I, AI Air Assist. Now, since our last episode or the kind of the gameplay episode that I did before, um, I've really been focusing on the air war here. It is very, very similar to War in the West, uh, which I actually think is a good thing. Um, we are going to do a combination. I'm going to show you how to just let the AI handle it. OK, uh, now there are a few things you need to set for that, but I'm going to also mix that in with my own manual manipulation. And don't kick me off of YouTube for saying those two words together. Uh, we are gonna kind of do a hybrid here. Uh, and I'll try to show you some of the manual, we're not gonna do, it's not gonna all be manual. That would take way too much time. Um, we are not going to have this enhanced uh, theater box control, not for the first playthrough. It takes some time. It takes some brain power. Let's just play the game. So we're on normal. This all looks good. This is how we're going to play it. Uh, I've already messed around with the preferences. We don't have to worry about that. So let's go to the 1941 campaign. Let's pay, play the big papa here. Uh, why screw around around the lucky Lukey? We're going to do that eventually anyway. Uh, so let's just go to the big one. Um, Florian 1976 is here. Phantom is here. Phantom 453. Uh, some regulars on the channel. Thanks, guys. Thanks for stopping by. This should be a lot of fun. Now, as the old country song goes, if I you know, have to sit here and think for a minute, um, 
Well, I don't think that's how the country song goes. The the country song is like, you know, what is it? Call me dumb, but you're only going to call me that once. No, you can call me dumb as much as you want. I am going to take my time, though, and try to do things the right way. If we do get stuck at a spot and I say, you know, I really need to go read the rule book. Uh, we may just move on to a different part and then we'll come back to that later. Again, this is going to be kind of a trial and error. Uh, usually I would have a week or so to kind of prepare a Let's Play or tutorial. But hey, this is a heck of a lot more fun. You can see how I can react on my feet, how quick I am. Uh, let's go to our new events, which is probably the first thing you should always click on when you see one of these pop up. Uh, and let's get, actually, before we do that, let's get over here onto Map Info um, so we can kind of see all of our icons. Let's look at the turn summary. We don't really need to look at that anymore, so let's take that off. Now our news events are gone, you may say. That's not true. We can always get them back. Uh, and I believe that's it. Show events. Okay, so this is our first news event. Uh, I don't know if you want me to sit here and read the whole thing to you, but the basic idea is that on the 22nd of June 1941, the invasion of the Soviet Union began, opening up the Eastern Front, committing Germany to a two-front war, the Axis Powers Offensive, invading along a 2,900-kilometer front that stretched from the Arctic in the north to the Black Sea in the south, saw the greatest invasion force ever known to mankind, around 3.8 million men, 600,000 vehicles, and 600,000 horses. Wow. That's a lot of horses. I guess I didn't realize there were that many horses. Um, why is that jumping down there so much? Hold on. Uh, at the time of the invasion, the Red Army was in the process of a reorganization. Reorganization. That's what happens when you kill all of your generals. And modernization. Its capabilities were greatly reduced from the purges of the 1930s. Okay, so they referenced it. Strongly affecting the quality of the officer corps. Moreover, the standing morale of the Red Army. So on and so forth. The Titanic struggle begins. So that is our event log. I think we should probably always go click on those first. Now you may say, what are we going to do first? Uh, it's a great question, one I asked myself. Uh, let's go to the commander screen because we are going to do what I always do in War in the East 1. Now hold on, we must be clicked on a unit. Let's get off of that unit. Let's go to the commander screen. Uh, commander's report, headquarters, there's all of our headquarters. Okay, so we've got all of our headquarters here, um, and you see support level. Now, this is exactly like War in the East 1. They've got everybody set at F3. Now, what does that mean? Well, you have these basic areas of support units. You have artillery, um, you can have, gosh, I just had a blank. You can have pioneers, you can have construction units, you can have motorized guns. Uh, those are generally brigades, battalions, companies, regiments, okay? There's something smaller than a division. They're not represented on the board. They are attached to headquarters units. And what you see here by support level is... Um, Essentially, you're asking when you have set this at a three, and we can change this. So we could go here, we could set this to anything from one to nine, okay? When you set that, what you're asking for is three of each type, okay? And there's six or seven main types. We'll get into that more. There's six or seven main types of support units. You're asking for three of each of those at every headquarters, essentially, that you've got on the map. Now, when we went through the War in the East 1 playthrough, my take on how to do these is I like to be very hands-on with them, um, and I like to have a lot of options and flexibility. I think that's uh, the real advantage of them. You can put units that you need. Uh, for instance, if you have a big fortification, you may want more pioneers. Uh, they're good at breaking down fortifications. So you can push them down. I call, I call it the push method. Some people call it the pull method. You can call it whatever the heck you want. But what we're going to do is take all of these support units and we're going to pull them all the way up to the top, all the way to OKH or Romanian High Command, Hungarian High Command. We're going to pull those all up to the High Command. Um, 
yeah, CJ, that's right. If we're going to fail, let's do it as publicly and spectacularly as possible. I live by that motto. Uh, you know, if I get a little egg on my face here and you say, come on, man, what in the world? I can, I can always blame the fact that it was my first playthrough. Uh, you're really seeing, you know, this is like my first night out drinking in college or something. You may see some of the good, some of the bad, and maybe a lot of the ugly. We shall see. Um, okay, so back to support units. What we're going to do is draw them all to the top. Why do we do that? Well, because before we fight a battle, we can always pull them back down or push them back down. Call it either one you want. The point being is we're going to continually have them go up headquarters levels. How does that work? Well, it happens naturally in the game, in the logistics phase, that support units, wherever they are at that point, in the logistics phase, will look around and say, okay, um, does this uh, core headquarters want me here? If it doesn't, it will move up one level each turn. So if it's at the core, oh, well, let's start all the way at the bottom. If it's attached directly to a unit, you have to unattach it. So we'll go through that. But if it's at the core level, meaning the core headquarters, so the core headquarters is going to command two to four divisions generally. Uh, they could command one, or they could command none, I guess, but generally they're going to command two to four divisions. When those support units are at the core headquarters, they are available for battle or for use, depending on what they are, uh, for every division underneath that core headquarters. The same goes for the army headquarters. Any support units at the army headquarters are available to be pushed down. Now, they will not automatically show up there. At the core level, though, they do automatically show up out at the battlefield. And I say automatically, but let's say we have two artillery support units at the core headquarters, and we have two divisions that are underneath that core. When they go into battle, the general will decide. Then they'll do a dice roll to discern to determine if his decision is carried out, whether to commit those to battle or not. Now, one thing to throw in there is you can attach these directly to divisions. They will be automatically committed to battle. But when you play the Axis, you have a, an abundance of good generals that make good decisions and they almost always pass their dice rolls and so really keep the flexibility by keeping those support units higher and i think most people that watched war in the east one my let's play can tell you that as we go through the game it will all start to make sense to you if i'm speaking greek right now i'm not actually it's english which is my first language uh but you know question how well i speak it but in all seriousness it will start to make sense to you as we play the game and you'll say oh okay that's how they move that being said how are we going to do this well we're going to set the support level all right for everything on this screen right now to zero and you see all of these changed to zero yep they're all zero that's what we want okay now you see part of the reason we do that is these this is how many support units each headquarters has it's very uneven at the start of the game for instance uh eighth corps out here in the ninth army has 25 support units a general can only commit six to battle at a time and so this is a very uneven uh, you can see here in the fourth army the 13th corps has none so what we're going to do is pull them up and then we'll redistribute okay so we've set these all to zero what does that do that means it's telling the ai we're not requesting that you keep any at our level and they'll push them all up one level core will go to army army will go to army group army group will go all the way up to okh or romanian high command the, the high commands is where they'll flow back up to so we'll put those at zero now i say that but we actually have to do one other thing to make this all work and that is if we go down here to formation type let's click off of that and let's do high command so now you see all of the high commands we've got OKH, we've got Hungarian, Romanian, Slovakian. Apologies to the Czechs. Uh, I did reference in my War in the East 1 
uh, let's play mistakenly that the Czechs were part of the Axis. It's not the Czechs, it's the Slovaks. Uh, the Slovakians were part of the Axis. The Czechs actually fought for the Allies. Apologies to any Czechs out there. Totally inadvertent, as you may suspect. I have nothing against the Czech people. How many times have I said that in my life? Um, okay, so we've got OKH. This is our army headquarters. OKW, uh, we'll get to that. Italian High Command, Finnish High Command. Hey, Italian Southeast Army Group. All right. Um, as you can see, some of these are not active yet, um, but these three are. And what are we going to do is we're going to set their support level to nine. That's the highest it can go. So we'll do nine. We'll do nine. And we'll do nine. Okay, and we can come back. Uh, we'll deal with this. Well, shoot. You know what? Let's set the Slovaks to nine. They will eventually jump in here. We'll set the Italians to nine. Now, I could have just done this up here at support level, but hey, why do things the easy way? Uh, Finnish high command. Sure. Uh, Italian C Southeast Army. Okay. Um, 999. OKW, okay, we'll get back to that. Uh, okay, so we're going to be drawing all of our support units to the top. That's always the first thing I do in any War in the East game. All right, uh, David Rousson. Hello, sir. How are you? Oh, we got uh, a new sub. Thank you very much. Enrico X. I can't even say that. Uh, hey, Stanley, how are you? Rock of Soccer, good to see you. Uh, Nicholas Cage, gosh, I wish you were, I wish you were the real one. Maybe you are. Hey, I don't know. Um, Nicholas Cage might be a wargaming fan. No, I'm glad you are who you are, Nicholas Cage. Uh, oh, little distortion. Eh, it's possible. This is about the crappiest old uh, headphones headset ever. You know what? I'm going to unplug it really quickly. And then I'm going to plug it back in, and we'll see if maybe it's a... Now we'll see if it's a little better. You guys can let me know. Uh, it's very possible this is an old, janky headphone. I, You know, if I'm going to be doing this uh, over the next 50 years, I probably should just buy a new headphone set. Uh, but I'm just used to this old one. It's my work one, and I, you know, they don't care what I sound like at work, believe me. Um... Okay, so we've done that. That's the first thing I always like to do. Now we're in the air planning stage. So this is where you start the game. Now we selected AI assist right here. You see it darkened out, meaning we've selected that and that's the way we're going. We would have to go change that in the options. Now, if you do not select that in the options, that tick box for the AI support, this will allow you to push it down and get AI assist all right the air war in this game as we go along i think it will make more and more sense to you i don't think it makes sense for me to sit here for two hours and, and explain every last detail of it the basic idea of, is this you have a command structure just like you do on the ground side now they're split you know right in the middle Ground is on this side, air is on this side. So just forget about the ground structure other than I will use it as a comparison, okay? So if you think about on the ground, you've got Army Group North, all right? And it controls the two armies and the Panzer Group in the north. So all of the troops in the north. Likewise, on the air side, you have Luftflot 1, and Luftflot 1 is like Army Group North headquarters, but for air. It controls the air in the north. And you've only got three, well, you have four or five, but for the Germans, you only have three to worry about. Luftflot 1, right down here, Luftflot 2, and Luftflot 4. Um, my supposition is that Luftflot 3 is in the west, but I, I don't know that specifically, uh, but I can't think of another reason exactly why it wouldn't be here, why they would number them that way. Maybe maybe they just, I don't know, Luftflot 3 is what trains pilots. I don't know that uh, just off the top of my head historically. 
Okay. Oh, one thing I will point out, I've got the soft uh, counter info here set on supply. So when you see the little green there, we are in good supply. Um, wow, got a lot of people showing up. It's good to see all of you. Thank you so much. We always have a good time here every day. Uh, we always play Grigsby games, it seems, or that's how the channel's gone so far. Strategy Gaming Dojo has only been around uh, since November. I decided to start it right before Thanksgiving, and it's gone, you know, better than my expectations, believe me. I just love these games. I love to play these games, and I guess I missed my calling as a uh, high school history teacher, or college professor, so I do it, uh, I do it over these games. Uh, anyway... Luflot 1 is like Army Group North, except for the air. All right? One Flieger Corps is one step down from that. So Army Group North, if that was here, it has 18th Army in the purple, and it has 16th Army in the pink underneath it. However, on the air side, Luflot 1 only has one Flieger Corps. It's like it only has one army under its command. Uh, in the north. That's just how it is. Now, as we get further down here, you can see Luflot 2 actually has two Flieger Corps. It has two Flieger Corps. That was kind of confusing. It has two overall Flieger Corps. This one just happens to be named two Flieger Corps. And then you've got eight Flieger Corps. Okay, so it's just like having two armies underneath it if this was Army Group Center. Uh, but it's in the air, all right? Uh, same in the south here, we have Luflot 4. It's got five Flieger Corps. It's got the Slovak Expeditionary Air Brigade. It's got the First Royal HAF. Uh, those are Hungarians, I believe, um, that are underneath it. And then it's got, uh, we've got another Flieger Corps down here. So in the center and the south, we have two Flieger Corps underneath our Luftflot. Okay, but in the north, it's a lot simpler. You've just got one. Now then, let's say on the ground, you had select, or we're talking about 16th Army. 16th Army has a headquarters. It just happens to be right there. It then has core headquarters underneath it. Same idea for the Flieger Corps. The Flieger Corps has the equivalent of core headquarters underneath it. And you can see them here in the smaller blue boxes. All right, so if we select all of Luflot 1, don't be confused by these dark blue boxes. We'll get to those in a minute. Those are just airfields. I know it can be a little confusing, but for now, let's just talk about the command structure. We've got Luflot 1, we've got one Flieger Corps. All right, then we have the equivalent of core headquarters out here. They just happen to be for the air, and you can see them all lit up when we're on Luflot 1, and then they're different colors here. So for eight Flieger Corps, you can see the core, quote-unquote, core headquarters that are underneath it. All right, um, these are kind of always called Kaloofs. I, I've actually never heard that term before. Sometimes they're KG. Uh, that could sound for Kaluf something, but they're like core headquarters. Now, these core headquarters will have the groupas assigned to them directly, okay? And so they've actually got the groupas or the squadrons in them, and they can be at multiple air bases within the range of this, I'm going to call it an air core, all right, just to keep that thought process happening. I'm going to call that an air core. All right. And if we click on KG 77, it's part of one Flieger Corps. So you see it's commanding headquarters. All right. It tells you how many planes you have, how many, uh, well, this is how many you have overall. Here's how many are active or ready. All right. Then we'll get into these uh, different uh, commands that you can give it. Then you see the different air bases where it has groupas or swarms. If I call them squadrons, I understand that's an American term. The Germans generally called them groups or groupas. But if I say squadron, just know what I mean is a group of aircraft that are all of the same make and are together. 
okay? So a group, a swarm, uh, a squadron, whatever the case may be. And you see them, the individual ones here, and they have their, you know, their name right here. Then it tells you how many of those planes there are and of what type, all right? Um, this, we could even go down to this level, all right? And oftentimes we'll want to, it will tell us what kind of plane this is, what its name is, what kind of plane it is, kind of an icon for it. It even now has the unit decal, which I think is really cool, right? That's pretty awesome. Um, it kind of gives you a picture of the main plane that, oh, well, the only plane, right? If it's in this squadron or grupa, they're all of the same make and model, all right? So it's the JU-88A, it's a level bomber, uh, a German medium bomber. Then you see some of the orders it has over here. Its air headquarters is Luftflotte 1, okay? That's its overall air headquarters. It's AOG. Now, what is that? That is its direct command, all right? So we just had clicked on this. Uh, well, you can see it over here, um, KG-77. And so let's get back on that individual one. KG-77 is its AOG. You can reassign it, all right? So you can go out here and automatically reassign it uh, if you want to. So these are air operational groups. All of these are. And when I say all of them, what do I mean by that? Let's click off this for a second. Luflot 1 is an AOG. One Flieger Corps is an AOG. Transport Group Nord, North, is an AOG. So when they say air operational groups, what they mean are these, the commands, all right? Um, so while we're down here, let's just keep looking through this one since we looked at it. Now, what you see here on the map, when we have it picked out, it puts up here what, you know, what we've selected. This is its command radius. So this is essentially planes in this area can be under its command, all right? And then it lights up the air bases where planes under its command are located, all right? Um, now let's back up for a second because I know that's a lot to sort of take in and you have two different ideas merging together here, which is you've got this command structure that's out here and then you've got airfields that are out here. And it's a big difference between the previous game and this one. Um, the E is not silent in Luflata. Oh, Stanley. I, I don't speak German, Stanley. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, I'll try, Stanley. We'll see. We'll see. Uh, Stanley asks, how does this feel compared to the old one? Better. Better. Uh, this feels like a new game. Uh, look, it's still a hex and counter uh, board game on a computer doing only the calculations a computer can do. And so those are always going to be, you know, it's not like we're playing Call of Duty here, but I'll say I really like the user interface. I also like the changes they've made to the game so far. And I tell you that honestly, you know, as I've jumped into it, so that's why I say so far, I haven't gotten all the way in and figured out depots and exactly how I want to use those, but so far, I really like the feel of it. Um, okay, so these two concepts kind of come together. Don't be confused by it. When you have the Luflot selected here, it shows you all, everything under its command lit up. Kind of forget about the airfields. Now, I know you may say, huh? How are we going to do that? Well, Really, you're going to be giving your directives or your orders or your priorities, however you decide to play the air war part of it, through this command structure. You're not going to be doing it at the air base. The game sort of takes care of that for you. It will move planes to air bases for you to set up for your air directives. And so, yeah, air bases are going to be very important that we capture them and we can move our, our air groups or squadrons up, but you really don't have to 
deal with that, I guess. And so to some extent, just think about the command structure and giving the commands. Okay, so now that we've kind of just done a, a grand overview, what now? Like, what do we do first, okay? Well, when the game starts, there are already preloaded air directives in. And what do I mean by air directives? Well, let's go to the air directive summary. And here we see it. And let's just focus on Luflata. Okay. Uh, one. Let's just focus on this one so we don't get lost, okay? Its commander is Alfred Keller. All right, he's got a six air score. That's okay, it's not great. You see Kesselring down here has an eight, uh, but he was a renowned uh, air commander, maybe the best, at, le at least best on the German side for sure. Uh, and so his is an eight. Uh, and then they show their admin skills. So how well they're getting in supply, just the administration. The things that you would think the game rolls for for administration, it rolls for. How many max air directives can he handle? In, in Alfred Keller's mind, how many can he handle? 32, which seems excessive. I can't imagine in this game that you would actually do 32 air directives in a turn. But what are air directives? Well, it's these items right here. And what the game has done, it's already set this up for you. We have assist AI. It sets up the air directives on turn one. This just is stock. This is the default, okay? So what we see here is in the north, we would be flying recon mission. Then we have another couple of groups that would be flying recon missions. This is the staging base, all right? So the game has picked Ebon Road, Tilsit, and Noisadil or Noisadil, Nois Noisadil, uh, for staging ground attacks, ground support. All right. How does this all work in practicality? Well, you could set these yourself, but the game has set them. All right, as this is the default, as you see in the center, and I said we're going to focus on loop flat one, and we will, but I just want to show you for comparison's sake. Luflata 2 in the center, recon, recon, ground support, ground attack, ground attack. Okay. Um, so they're doing a few more ground attack missions. They have more planes down there. They have an extra Flieger Corps. So that's probably why they're flying more missions. Here you can see what they're doing in the south. All right. But let's go up to 1 and let's just click on recon. Okay. And let's back up. Now then, what is this? Well, this is air directive number one. This is essentially, think of it like this. You've given Luftflotte one an order. You said, I want you to run recon in the north. Well, you didn't do it, the AI did it, but let's make believe for a second. You've told the game, I want you to run air recon in the north. It's no different than the old game when you would hit the recon button and then right click out here somewhere and it would go fly a recon mission. The only difference here is this is not just one mission. This is an order. So you're telling Luflotta 1 in week one of the war, we want to run recon targeting this hex and the how many ever hexes this is? I know it's 10. Uh, hold on. Let me get something off here. Victory points. Off. Okay. What you're telling the game, and you didn't set this up, but we'll get to that. I want you to run recon in this area all of week one. And then the game sets up the specific missions. Okay? So you don't have to go in and say, fly here, fly here, fly here, fly here. You know, you set kind of something in the center. This box then comes up, and I'll show you how to do that in just a second. And then it will be flying recon missions all week to the extent that the game thinks that they're good missions. All right. Um, now then, how do we control some of this? So we're on this air directive. We see here, assigned air directives. We've given them four orders this week. 
4 of 4. Now we saw that this commander can go up to 32. You can also save these. You can click them off for a turn here and click them back on. So let's say in week two, you don't want them to do recon. You could click that off, but you don't delete it. You could click it right back on. So these are just general orders. You're telling it recon around 191, 144, which is that hex right there with a radius of 10. Now, that is the largest radius that you can do. And when it says radius, it really means box. So this is 10 hexes this way, 10 hexes that way, 10, 10, okay? That's the first order that we've given it for this week or the game was set to default, but let's again, pretend that we gave this order, recon. The second order is this recon. And as you see, we want it to do everything in this box. We want it to run recon all in this box this week to the best of its ability, and it will do the actual missions. It will decide which air groups to send. It will decide whether to send them at day or night, unless we turn that off. Um, and so it's automated in the sense that you don't actually have to go control each mission because that would be overwhelming. There's going to be over 5,000 sorties flown in week one alone. You give it the general order. So why are there two recon orders? Well, because the maximum radius is 10, and we want to recon the whole northern front. So we, we have to do one recon order, two recon orders, and then that pretty much covers the whole north. And once that's set, that's it. You don't have to do anything else. When you hit this button up here to resolve air, all of those missions happen, um, and the AI does that, okay? Ground attack, one of the other major uh, air orders that you can give it. And if you want to know what air orders you can give, you can look right up here to where you can set them manually, and it, it'll tell you. These are the six different cars. Is it six or five? Six, I believe. Uh, ground support, uh, ground attack, strategic bombing, recon, which we've got two of those now, air superiority, and naval patrol. You can pretty much forget about this one. Uh, you know, I'm sure most of you are pretty familiar with the war, <laughs> you know, the war in the East, the actual historical one. There's not a whole lot of naval activity you have to worry about. Uh, it, it is there in case they're trying to resupply Odessa uh, or if you push far enough, uh, let's say maybe even Leningrad, I guess is a possibility, you can actually do a naval patrol, but for the most part, you can kind of forget that. Um, this is just show battle sites. I'm not sure why they didn't move this over because it really has nothing to do with the air here. So it's really air superiority, your fighters up trying to get superiority within the box that you set. It's... Uh, air recon, which we've already seen, strategic bombing, bombing cities, rail yards, plants, whatever. Uh, ground attack is somewhat similar. We'll get to that in a minute, but it's uh, airfields, rail yards, etc. Um, and then directly on ground support or nothing. But these are the manual controls. I'm just up here to show you what the different orders possibly could be. Okay, so this is ground attack, right? And down here, it will show you the settings that you can pick if you want to. You don't have to do this. The AI has already picked that our top priority will be airfields. That would be no surprise to you if uh, you've played War in the East 1, because on turn one, you bomb the crud out of their airfields, right? So it's already set it up this way. But you do, you can go in here and manually change pretty much anything you want to change. You can change the target hex, okay? So now you see the ground attack box. This is the order we have right now. Uh, I'm going to assume that right there is hex 175, 144. Well, let's just say you wanted to move this north, all right? You click on that, and then you would set it. Let's say here, and you click on that hex, and it moves the whole box, all right? So now that's your target. 
or we can select a new target. Oh, select new target. Come on. Ah, let's get back to it. Hold on. Air directives, ground attack. There we go. Um, I believe, can you do the shift key? That might be easier. Anyway, you can go here, left click and set a new target. If I can get it to go right, hold on. I told you there's going to be some bumps. Let's go back to ground attack. Oh, you have to go back here and hit hex again, I believe. Yeah. Let's go back here and hit hex again. Let's say we want, I don't know, something crazy all the way up here. Okay, now it's up there. Um, and you can go back here and hex, hit this hex as many times as you want and move where this box is. I know there's a way that you can actually move it. Let's get down in here. Ah, uh, there we go. If you left click where it is now and just start to drag it, let's uh, let's actually just leave it there for one second. That's how you do it. Okay, we'll back up. Uh, this is a good zoom level, right? If I left click here and move it like this, you can set this box anywhere you want. Well, where are their airfields? Uh, we see one there. We see one there. You know, you can see the airfields. Now, we don't have good recon on all of this, and that is what that green and purple is. This is where we already have recon. Purple, we do not. Uh, and so, just keep that in mind, right? Now then, so let's just make this our target hex, all right, and move on. Staging base, I would not worry about that. Uh, let the game pick the staging base. It's generally going to pick a good one, uh, so let it pick it. Area. Now remember I talked about how you could make the box bigger or smaller? Let's say we make it a one. Well, there you go. It's only gonna go within, in and around one hex of that. Uh, you can even make it zero so that you directly attack that hex, okay? Or what we would probably wanna do here in turn one is make it a 10. And so it's as big of an area as possible. That's what area is. Then you can tell it, do you wanna do day, night, day, night, I mean, you can you can pick uh, which of those you would like to do. Intensity, now of course, we want this on high, right? Because it's turn one, we wanna bomb the airfields as much as possible. Fly weather, poor. What does this mean? Greater than poor. So if the, if the flying weather is poor, meaning you have a lot of ground uh, or a lot of cloud cover, uh, if it's poor or less, you know, like terrible, I guess, blizzard or something, it won't fly. But this is telling fly the missions if it's greater than poor, and then it tells you what the current weather is in this box, or at least in the hex that you've selected, all right? Schedule, how many days of the week of this turn do you want this these missions to fly? Well, I mean, we probably, heck, I would like them to fly every day. Now this may wear out your bombers right? What this will actually do is spread these out over the seven days. You can see here, it's telling you how many missions it's going to fly. And right now, uh, is that right? Hold on one second. No, it's right here. Uh, this tells you how many missions total it will fly during the week, given your orders. And as you see, when we click on or off days, it's not making a difference. Why is that? Well, all this does is spread it out across days, and so you can give your pilots rest, and they could run it across four days. You could do it all on day one, which is what the AI had picked. You can also pick the altitude. I would tell you as a beginning player, if you haven't played War in the Pacific, you're not really familiar uh, with the altitudes that the aircraft like to run on, just forget about that. Let the AI pick that. There's just... Um, you know, there's no reason for you to go down that rabbit hole until you really understand other parts of the game. Uh, priority, very high. We could do it high, norm, low. For airfields, it's going to be very high. Uh, this is it has to do with, with escort and following certain paths. We'll get into that as we go along. Each one of those things has concepts, but that we'll need to know eventually if you you know, go to the advanced level, but for now, it's just not that important. Now you can come over here and tell the AI what your priorities are during this week for its ground attacks. Turn one, week one, it's airfield. 
we want them hitting as much or as many airfields as we can because the Soviet aircraft will be sitting on the airfield. So we can just blow up half of the uh, Soviet Air Force before they can even get up in the air, okay? Now you could do units, uh, and later on we'll of course switch it over to units if we want to go out and offensively bomb, all right? Railways, ports, ferries, interdiction, uh, we talked a lot about interdiction in War in the East 1. It's one of my favorite parts of the game. I think it's underutilized. I say it's favorite part. It's uh, one of the most useful parts of the game. I think it's somewhat underutilized by a lot of players. All this does is we will bomb Soviet units when they move. Okay? And so during their turn, when they're trying to move, we go and bomb them. It kind of stops them in their tracks, makes them lose movement points. But anyway, that's interdiction. Uh, rail yards, later on, we may want to keep the Soviets from retreating back, and so we'll go hit their rail yards and try to bust up their rail. All right, that kind of covers what you need to know about that. Let's go to ground support really fast. Um, ground support is a, more of an AI type thing. You can see really what you're doing is you're telling the AI which units out there you want to do ground support for. What is ground support? Of course, if they get in a combat into a battle, we'll send fighters or bomb. I say we, the AI may, if they think it's advisable, send bombers, fighters to the fighting. In this case, the AI has picked Army Group North. So it's protecting all of the units in Army Group North. That seems like a pretty wide setting to me. We'll probably eventually change that, but for turn one, I'm not going to. This is going to support us in all of our battles, so the Air Force will come and support us. Luftwaffe uh, will come and support us uh, in all of our battles. All right, so let's click on Recon really fast. Recon works exactly the same way. All right, you can go here, strategic, uh, we won't go into that now. We can tell we can tell it the priorities of what we want to recon. In this case, we're saying it's a high priority to recon airfields, which makes sense, right? We want to get out there, see these airfields, see what's on them, try to get as good of a detection level as we can on them um, before we bomb them. Uh, so you know that makes sense to be at high. So this is high, medium, low, none. That's what these little uh, boxes are here. And you can pick them for everything. So Soviet units, we're saying that's a low priority. Uh, you know, we don't want it to do none. We want it to fly out, see where the Soviet units are. That's, that's fine. Uh, it's low, though. Railways, ports, ferries, those kind of bigger infrastructure things. Uh, I guess a ferry is not an infrastructure, but ports and railways, we have a pretty good idea of where those are. Uh, there's not a whole lot of reason to run recon missions to know where the railway is. I mean, the Germans had maps, you know, they, they knew where the Soviet railways were. They weren't great rail, or they were different railways. Let's put it that way. Anyway, um, interdiction, we've got that at low. Uh, mainly because the Soviets, we don't care quite as much about their movement here in turn one. We would rather, the real priority are the airfields. Rail yards, we're not going to hit those yet. Now, I did see in the comments somebody mentioned, hey, now we can bomb the rail yards uh, and maybe keep them, uh, keep them, the Soviets, from retreating as fast. That's true, and I think that that will be something that really good players can figure out and try to uh, take advantage of. Um, so let's look at the target. This is the target. It's hex 191, 144. Let's click on it, and you can see we can drag the recon box around. So where do we want the AI to run these, air, these uh, recon missions that we've told it to run? Let's say here, all right? So now we move the box. And now it will highly prioritize airfield here, uh, reconning airfields, all right? And you can move this box around again. I don't know if you can do it. Yeah, you can do it. So if you, if you just press on the hex where it is, you can just move this box around as much as you want. Now, all right, and all of these other things are the same. You've got altitude, what days, how many days, day one, day three, day five. Do you want them to spread it apart? Uh, I will tell you the numbers here are highly are mainly affected by 
the area. So let's move the area down to one and go down here and see. See, it's only two now. It will only run two missions this week, but let's pop that back up to 10. There we go. And now it's gonna run 56 missions. Okay, so the AI will adjust depending on how big of an area you wanna deal with, how many planes it's got. You, it's very automated in some ways, but you do have control over what it's going to do. And these are the error directives. These are the big general orders you're giving your Luftwaffe. All right. Now then, it'll go down here and tell you who is assigned to these missions. And there are two air operational groups assigned to this recon directive. All right. They're coming from Kulov North and Kulov 16. How many planes there are. Uh, it'll tell you what kind of planes you can get down here and look into all that. Don't worry about it. Not at the start. I just don't think that it's something you should concern yourself with so much. Let the AI at the start kind of do the air war with a little bit of input from you. Okay. For instance, uh, on ground attack, I move this up to high intensity, which means it's going to fly more missions. Um, why? Well, because we want to bomb the crud out of as many airfields as we can, but kind of keep it to that level. What do I want it to bomb? How high the intensity over how big of an area and where? I, I would just keep it to those ideas. All right. All right, then. Now, let's say let's click off this for a second. Let's go to Luftflot 1. And let's go down to, let's say that you wanted to do something that you don't see. All right. Let's click on ground air attack up here on the directive. Now, I'm just going to show you this quickly because I really at this stage, I don't think any of us, including me, should probably mess around with the AI too much. I plan on playing this one mainly with how the AI would run the air war. But let's just say that it doesn't have ground attack up here. Now it does, but let's just say it doesn't. Well, you know what? Let's just take it off there. Delete that error directive. It's gone. We are no longer doing ground attack, but we're on the air directive button for ground attack. And so it's put this asterisk ground attack here. We can click on that. All right. Then what do we, now it's all bolded. It says left click on the map to select the target. All right, so let's kind of go back and try to recreate the box that they had. And let's just say here. All right, now you see the center hex for this ground attack, 182, 139. We'll click it down to low for interdiction, high for airfields. All right, don't worry about the staging base. Let the AI do that. Now then, let's increase the area to 10. There we go, and there's your box. And that's how you create these air directives yourself. You know, I say now, uh, I say now that I'm not gonna be doing that manually. I think anyone that's watched my channel for a while will say that is a lie, my friend. You will start setting these manually and I will, but for now, let's say we're not. I just wanted to show you how to do it. Um, and I'll just do it one more time, just so, you know, and again, you can go down here and set the schedule, how many days it'll be spread across, the weather, what that has to be, the intensity, day or night, the area, the overall area that it's going to be trying to fly missions into. Um, again, don't worry about the staging base, what your priorities are. You know, it, it gives you a lot of choices for a fairly automated system. Uh, think of it this way you're giving it the big orders right the game itself is going to carry out those orders um okay now once you've set it up the way you want it you just have to hit confirm you confirm the error directive now it's set up there you go now it's still highlighted here because you can go down here and you know change this around if you wanted to then you would have to confirm it again now word of caution if you're on ground attack up here and you want to do another directive, an air directive, and set it manually, click here first, no air directive um, selected. Whoops, where did air, where did it go? Luftflot, come back, come back my Luftflotta. Uh, there it is, all right. 
click off of these first because if you switch between them, it will delete the error, the error directive that you just set up. That's something that I'm gonna you know, write an email about because I, I don't think it should work that way. Uh, I would show you, but I just don't wanna take the time to do it. The basic point is, is if you're on ground attack, before you go try to set another error directive, don't just flip over to one of these buttons. Go back to none, reselect the Luflotta, and then enter it. And how would you do that? Well, let's say we want to do it more recon, all right? Air recon directive. I click on that. It automatically sets it up here. Asterisk recon. Hit, hit on that. Nope. We've already, it's already bolded. So now all we have to do is go set the target. So let's say that we uh, want to recon the Baltic Sea. Can we do that? Nah, unfortunately we can't. Um, okay, let's say we want to recon with this as the center hex. We've now set that up. You see it here, 183, 132. It's got a zero radius. We don't want that. All right, so we'll go down here to area. We'll set it to 10. There's your, we back up. There's your recon box now. Uh, we want it to recon airfields, uh, interdiction no, uh, low, you know, poor fly weather spread across four days. This says auto to uh, area 10. Is it because it's out or I, we may not have enough planes available to do that. That's why it's not running more missions. Oh, no, no, no. Actually, I do know why it's doing this. Uh, we'll hit confirm. And there, we have a new air directive. And we've set it on auto. Now these two say two AOGs. It's selected those two already. This will just pull from any of those smaller core level, you know, whether it be Kulof, North, Transport, just don't get down into the weeds here. Let the game pick which, which groupas it pulls into it. Uh, it generally will do a good job of that. Okay, so that's air doctrines to some degree. We will go way more into that as we play the game, but right now I actually want to let the game play out a little bit. And to do that, I'm going to co get completely out of this scenario. I'm going to pick the scenario again, go to 1941 campaign, and we're not going to change anything, all right? Uh, as you can see, I've loaded this up a few times and tried different things. We're not going to change anything with the air directives, all right? Now, here are two screens to make sure you check before you hit the F12 button. Go up here, look at air directives. You can look, Luflot 1, as I said, this is, our, this is the default. The game is gonna do this automatically if we do nothing else other than hit next phase. So this is what the game's defaults are for each of your Luflottas. Um, and here they are. We're not going to change them at all. Okay? And we're going to hit next phase. And we're going to start seeing it fly. Well, hold on. Before we do that, let's actually click on the news item, get rid of that, and let's watch it run air missions. And you're going to see a box down here that keeps a tally of what's going on. And this is going to run all week, all seven days of the week, the air missions based on those air directives. Is it gonna show some of them to me? Let's hope so. There we go, all right. So now you start to see, and let's pause, all right? It has bombed, what is it doing? It's not telling us, attack, defend. Now usually it'll tell you attack airfield. It doesn't have that here, but aircraft on the ground, they have I-16s, SB-2s, U-2s, uh, that are transports, not the U-2 uh, plane you're thinking about. It's got some anti-aircraft, but you can see here, they lost 19 fighters, 16 utility craft on the ground from that bombing mission, all right? We lost one bomber. Continue. Now it lost 27. Now we keep hitting Odessa here, and you're seeing the aircraft on the ground go down. And every time we actually do a bombing mission, it will show us the results right up here. How much is lost? Men, guns, fighters, bombers, util. Um, airfield was bombed. We damaged the airfield. This is how many losses they took. All right, air combat. So this is air to air combat. We actually lost 21 bombers. 
evidently the AI decided it was a good idea to not escort those. All right, six I-16s hit on the ground at this air base. Forty-seven fighters. We we killed all of the air killed all destroyed all of the aircraft at that airfield. Uh, there are seventy-one here. We destroyed thirty-eight of them at Kishinev. <laughs> Arthur Luflata, Luflata, my friend. But you can continue to just watch these air missions play out. We continue to bomb airfields. You can see where, you know, what's happening here. Now down here, it tells you how many sorties you've run, how many sorties the Soviets have run, uh, how many air directive commands that they've carried out, 950, 192, how many losses that we've taken from air combat, from flak, operational, same with the Soviets, all right? And up here, now you can't see it, but we're only on day one of seven of this bombing campaign, all right? And so you can follow this, you can slow down the messages as much as you want, you can look at them, you can pause them, you can then continue. It will show you the route that was taken, it will show you the airfield that was bombed, and it'll show you the results. And you can make that as fast or as slow as you want to. But I'm gonna start uh, maybe hitting escape. There we go. And moving through these, if I can. Otherwise, this is gonna take a while. Let's hope I can. Also down here, you have air directives uh, and it'll tell you the exact air directive that is being carried out that you're watching. So it'll tell you, um, you know, how many planes, how many raids, how many sorties, how many losses for each one of those air directives. You can also watch here and go through a log and see every single strike that was carried out. All right. So that's really something. That is a lot of detail if you want to get into that level of detail. Now, is this just going to take forever? Probably. Let's see. I don't think I can speed this up. Can Oh, message level one. Let's see if that speeds it up a little bit. Yep. Now we're, now we're rolling. Uh, maybe we'll back it off to two. You can do that on the numbers on your keyboard. Uh, one is the fastest. Seven is the slowest. Uh, but now they're moving right along. Two looks about right. Um, stats, let's get that back up. As you can see, we've destroyed 916 Soviet aircraft, most of them on the ground. Now, if I can make a suggestion, I would say when you start this, probably scoot uh, your zoom level out so you can get a better look on the map of exactly, you know, what's being hit. That probably would have been a good idea, but hey, we're learning here, aren't we? I actually prefer this air war. Um, you may not, and I understand that. Uh, I think war in the East One was much easier. I would certainly agree with anybody that would say that. Uh, it was much simpler. I think this actually will do a lot better job. And I think once you get used to it, you'll find you have a lot more control, uh, even though it is a lot of AI that's gonna be doing this. All right, I'm gonna speed this up to message level one. We'll just watch this running counter here. We're still in day one. Uh, yeah, look at it go now. Look at it go now. You know, if you really wanted to, if this ever happened to you, you can always go back and look at each one of those icons on the show battle screen. Go right down here to the air and you can go to each one of them and see exactly what happened. Now, day one is, of course, going to be the busiest day. I think that the game or the AI sets up all of your airfield bombing to be on day one. I wouldn't do it that way, but uh, not completely. Okay, now we're into day two. This will go by fast. Night three, day three. And you can kind of get the idea here of how this starts. It's it starts it's trying to do its air directives, but it all kind of matters what days that those directives uh, have told it. 
to fly missions. So now we're up to day five. Six. And seven. So just to, okay, and now, now it takes you to the error execution phase summary. And this will tell you everything you need to know about every error directive that was given. Uh, you know, the number of sorties, the number of lost aircraft from each one, how many were damaged, how many enemy uh, losses there were. You can go in and see all of that from this screen. Um, so it gives you a lot of information. Now, just to recap, I did not set up anything there. All I did was start the game. The air directives were already loaded in, all right? And I just hit execute. And you can do that as well if you don't wanna jump right into the air war. I will tell you this, if you are gonna play it almost fully on AI, there are a couple of buttons that you wanna press at, at your Luftflotte level, Luftflotte level. That is day and night. If you don't want them to fly at night, you just pick that at the headquarters for Luftflotte 1. And I was wrong last time. There actually is a counter, but just for the Luftflottes here. That's it. So Luftflotte 1 is here but you don't have to do anything with it. The game will actually start to move that. So we'll get to that as we go along. All right, so we've done the air war. Now let's get to what you guys really want to see, and that is the ground war. Now we've gotten some recon on these units. We have an idea of what's out here. You can now see the airfields on the map. Uh, they were kind of hard to see in the war in the, war in the East 1 map. Um, but now you can see them. You can also really tell the difference between light woods and heavy woods. You can also see the more substantial rail lines and the less substantial rail lines. Uh, as a matter of fact, on the map info, uh, we can also see roads if we want to. I think I'm going to keep that on. Um, now every hex has its own road level. So like this has got average roads. Uh, let's go up here. This, is, this has got two highways through it, it seems like. Uh, no, average roads. Okay, but I kind of like to know where those roads are. If we're out here, does it have poor roads? Yeah, it's got poor roads, right? Because these actually have, you know, big enough roads, probably high, the equivalent of like a highway, maybe a two-lane highway or something that we can move down. So I think I'm going to leave that on. I'm going to take victory points off. Uh, what else do we want to set here? Interdiction levels, set interdiction levels. Uh, no, we're not going to go into that quite yet. Uh, the weather, we could go look at the weather. Uh, let's look at the weather screen. Okay, as you can see here, weather on the ground is what we have checked. It's clear. There uh, appears to be mud up here at the top of the Scandinavian countries. Uh, so that appears. There's no snow, of course. We're in the middle of June. Uh, I guess in, in the Soviet Union, anything is possible, right? Uh, if you want to see what the weather is like in the air, you can do it here. Clear, rain, heavy, cold, snowfall, blizzard. Okay. You can also the, see the different climate zones. Uh, so what do we have here? H humid and warm. This is just humid, humid and cold. Um temperate and human? I don't know. I can go look at all these, but I'm not going to. Um, road system. Okay, well, you can see the road system. I'm not sure how helpful that is. Uh, yeah, there's roads that kind of go through here. I, I'm not sure about that one. Poor average. Oh, okay. Poor average good. So I guess this does kind of show you a little bit of something. Their average, where there actually are those roads on the map, I believe, uh, it looks that way. Okay. Excellent. Now you may say, what's that big circle? Well, let's go back to weather ground. This is a weather front moving in. That's a new addition to the game. There will be fronts that move across the map and you can kind of see where, hey, there might be a change in the weather based on the front. Now I am no meteorologist. And so, you know, I high pressure, low pressure, 
uh, you know, I don't know. I, I ought to get one of the, well, I've got a green screen behind me. I ought to get a, a, like one of those clickers and be like the guy on the evening news and tell you what it all means. I don't know what it all means, uh, but those fronts will move across the map, and that's part of what makes the weather far more variable in this game. Uh, because they do affect the weather. It affects how, whether it rains lightly or heavily, or whether, uh, if there's precipitation, whether it becomes snow. Uh, it's quite detailed, but I, I'm not going to spend our time sitting here talking about weather. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's, that's the kind of conversation, you know, you have when you meet somebody you haven't seen in a couple of years, and you know how, you don't have any idea what's going on in their life. Uh, anyway... All right, what else do we want to see? We could take the units off if we want to. You can see our airfields if we do that. All right, not sure why those are ringed in red. Oh, that's because they're over capacity at this moment, but the AI will take care of that for us. Um, zoom, yeah, zoom in, zoom out. Russian control or Soviet control, I do want to see who controls what, always important. Fort levels, I don't think it's a big, well, we see a one down here. I'm going to leave that on for the first turn. Uh, rail, yeah, we don't want that on yet. Uh, combat delays, toggle on or off. Can't remember exactly how that works. Uh, okay, all of this stuff, I'm just making sure that I'm not forgetting anything. Logistics info, you can see the depots. We'll get into that as we start to move. Factory locations, we'll get into that as we move. Uh, oh yeah, okay. This shows you, this toggle city capture dates, it shows you exactly historically what dates these cities were captured. Now that's really cool, I think. Um, so it kind of gives you a benchmark, right? So let's click Actually, yeah, let's click out and let's go to, shoot, I don't know. Let's go to Rostov, uh, if I can get there. Come on, man. There we go. Let's go to Rostov. I guess maybe you have to be in the, yeah, you got to be all the way zoomed down. All right, let's go back. There's Rostov. Okay, so Rostov was captured by the Axis on November 21st, 1941. Uh, looks like it was recaptured by the Soviets on November 29th, and then the Axis recaptured it July 27th of 42. The Soviets finally permanently captured it February 7th, 1943. I like that. So it gives you kind of a benchmark. Are you running ahead of the historical pace? Are you not? Uh, that's really cool. I, I like that. I like that a great deal. Wow, look at this. It looks like uh, Germany has been made into a human body. Uh, those are the road networks, as you can see, not nearly as prevalent in the Soviet Union. All right, well, how do we usually start this game? How do we usually start it? We go right up here to the north and 26th Corps. All right, this is under Woodrig, I do believe. Yep, Albert Woodrig. Now, remember, uh, really, we don't have to spend AP points to switch commands now. You just have to spend them to switch generals now. So he would cost 10, and, well, we could get Modal right in the thick of it. You know I like that. We've got von Monstein here already. Uh, Rendulik is here, another excellent general. Uh, Hans Hube is an excellent general. Now, it looks to me like the costs aren't nearly as much, but I, that could just be a function of it being turn one. Um, what? Let's go figure out which core we want Modal in. Modal is your best infantry general, and so I like to put him in the north and push for Leningrad. I'm going to play this exactly like I played War in the East 1 until we know differently. Leningrad is always my number one priority. Rostov and Moscow are my secondary priorities. If you can take Leningrad, you're halfway home, my friend. Uh, maybe a little more than halfway. If you can take Leningrad, you can turn Army Group North down and start going after Moscow. And so I always play that way for the most part. Now, if I play a human that I played before and they know that, I may mix it up. 
Uh, but oh, and and Rikway, you want me to send Modal to Army Group Center? Yeah, that's the classical move: is to send Modal to actually command um, the Fourth Army. It's the most important army in the game, in my opinion, because generally, let's just back up for a second. I'm sorry. If you've watched War in the East 1, you know what my general strategy is. Uh, my general strategy is to use the panzer groups like you would use light cavalry in pre-motorized games, okay? So I don't use them to fight. I use them to go around the flanks and surround ideally now sometimes they're gonna have to fight uh, but really I use my motorized units as I said I really use them as like light cavalry and just try to get around everything now how have I lost Moscow out here where's Moscow Oral Kursk oh I guess I'm south of it I thought I was north of it sorry uh, Tula I know where we're going there's Moscow all right so generally how I approach this is I go after Leningrad, you know, full steam. Then I try to have second and third panzer group meet somewhere in here. I have, you know, second panzer come from the south, third panzer come from the north, meet here. Then I push kind of from Rezhev to the north of Moscow, and I have fourth army and ninth army come from the center and from the south. And so really fourth army in many cases is the most important army and they will be the ones that eventually take moscow now it could be the ninth army uh but really the fourth army has a little more strength in my mind uh and so the classical move is to have modal come down here and command fourth army i don't like to do that and i don't know how much you want i'll get into the tutorials why i don't have him actually command an army and instead i have him command a core i'll just say as a general rule just the way i play I know other people don't play this way, but just the way I play is I keep my best commanders at the core level as long as I can. I feel like they have more effect on the action. Uh, at the army level, they're once removed on the dice roll, and instead of having to beat a 10-sided die with their rating, they have to beat a 20-sided die with th their rating. So if Modal's an 8, if he's at the core level, he basically passes every roll every time. If he's at the army level, it's an 8 out of a possible 20 die roll. And so I like to keep them at the core level. That's just me. Um, and actually, I don't even know if that's exactly the same in this game. I should probably look, but we're playing the game now. Uh, now, he has only got... You see here, he can command 9 this time. So that's a little different. Most cores in 1 could command 8... He can command nine. What does he have with him? Uh, you can see here, he's got 61st Infantry, 217th Infantry. He's actually got this bicycle, bicycle recon directly attached. Uh, he's also got some other support units. I'm gonna keep that, I'm gonna get that out from, whoops. Oh, did I, oh, no, I just, I was like, man, did I just clear out all of those support units? I really hope not. Uh, bicycle Recon Battalion. Okay, now you can kind of get a general flavor of the overall types of support units. Infantry, uh, that's a support unit. These are the actual divisions. These are the infantry type support units attached. 402nd Bicycle, uh, Heavy Cannon. Haven't seen that name before. That's new to the game, Heavy Cannon, but it's artillery. Anti-tank, anti-aircraft, engineers, construction. All right, now then. As you may remember, we can assign support units. And how does this work? Well, these are the support units that are in the headquarters directly above us. So this is part of 18th Army, and you see some of the support units attached to 18th Army. It is also part of Army Group North, and so you'll see these. And it's also part of OKH. Ultimately, everything on the German side is part of OKH, right? So you can even pull from OKH. Now, remember when we did the support levels, we're pulling everything from OKH, uh, or pulling everything up towards OKH. But as you can see, that's not a problem because we can pull it right back down to our core level. 
Um, and so what are we going to do here? Well, let's go back. What does he have? He's got two artillery support units. He's got one anti-tank. He's got some flak. He's got Pioneer Battalion. Um, as you see here, it says support level three. We don't want that. When I restarted the game, did I not go back up and change that? It's very possible. Let's go to the command screen. Let's go to headquarters, if I can. Yep, they're all still here the same. Uh, I didn't change them, so I'm glad I thought about that. Uh, let's make everybody zero. All right, then let's search for high commands and let's make them all nine that will pull everything to the top okay good i'm glad i'm glad we went back and you know i kind of got lucky i forgot that i restarted the game and we needed to do that again um it's ponzer jaegers arthur yes best generals at the core level I, I think that's the best way to go. I do agree maybe modal should be in the center, but Leningrad is my most uh, desired target. Here you see 18th Army. 18th Army is underneath the command of Von Kuchler. Uh, he's a good general. Now, they don't give you the score of the general on the card anymore. You kind of have to right-click and then go click on him to see what his stats are. But as you can see, he's a 7 infantry with 7 for initiative and admin. That's very good. Uh, so we don't need to do anything there. You can also see the support units directly attached to the army headquarters right now. Um, what I'm looking for, though, is one core. All right, one core has six of nine as of right now. It's got the 1st Infantry Division, 11th and 21st. This is uh, Hans von Both. Von Both is not very good. We're going to pay the 10, and we're going to put, well, actually pay 11, and put modal in first core. And there is General Lieutenant Walter Modal, uh, a brilliant general, uh, to say the least. Okay, so we've got modal in one core. Maybe we should move one core first, but I'm not going to. Uh, and now we've almost spent all of our AP, but that's all right. We got to get modal on the board. And we're going to go back to this 26 core. We're going to figure out what else do we need? Cannon. Let's see, assigned sport units. This now is very nice. It shows you what each of these things are. They're uh, separated out. Construction and labor units do not worry about them. They'll go to the army and army group uh, level and be taken care of there. You don't have to worry about construction and labor. Just let, let the game take care of that. They've got rockets. Yes, the heavy werfers. I love me some heavy werfers. Uh, eh, we don't really, I don't think we need much flak. Uh, the Soviet Air Force has been pretty chewed up. Uh, motorized Brigade, that's kind of fun, but we may put that in with the Panzers. So that's at OKH. It now tells you where it's coming from. So that's great. We'll just leave it there at OKH and we'll put it in with the Panzers. The stuff at 18th Army, I mean, we could put some mixed flak in here. Uh, the reason is it's got the 88s, or at least I think it does. Let's right click. Uh, that didn't work. Shoot. That just clicks you out. Uh, okay. Um, that's motorized mixed flak, though. How about army light flak, motorized army flak? I'm going to have to go and look. This is uh, LW motorized. Usually the, the Luft, Luftwaffe... Uh, their units are not motorized. Let's put one in there uh, just for fun. We're going to go look at it here really quickly. All right, you see the asterisk here. We've moved it once this turn or pulled it down. We can't move it again. Let's look at this. Does it say motor? Yeah, it is motorized. Okay. Um, let's look at its elements. I think it's got the 88. Does it? Yeah, 88 millimeter flak. This is the gun that turns into an anti-tank gun uh, and becomes maybe the most effective one that the Germans have. So just keep that in mind when you see mixed flak, you can use that as anti-tank as well. Okay, uh, we do not have a weak area here. Uh, let's do shift Z. Always click shift Z. Why is that? It shows you who commands the unit. Uh, it'll draw a line here if I can get it right. Where are you? 
Come on, man. Why is it not doing it? Do it. There we go. It's a very thin tendril. Uh, we'll click on there. Now you can really see it. There's the orange line. It always draws an orange line to its headquarters. It shows you other units in yellow. Gosh darn it. Let's get off that. Well, that doesn't do me much good. It shows you units in yellow that are a part of its core. Um, and so I always find it very useful to use shift Z to get the command structure straight in your head. So let's shift, you know, on this unit, these other two divisions are part of its core. This is its core headquarters back here. All right. And as things spread out a little bit, you'll get to see that a little better. Now, I was just up here doing that, but I generally, when I play War in the East 1, like to move these units up here first and let them do our initial attacks. Now, as you see, it's showing us, you know, the path, how much it's going to cost. It's only costing us one. I assume that's because there are roads here and it's friendly territory. But I like to bring some of these up, and we can also put these units. They're right now attached directly to OKH. We can start putting them in, like, one core or the other cores that are up here in 18th Army. And I think I would like to do it with this unit. Uh, do I want to come here or here? Do I want to attack there? Probably. Got to figure out exactly where we want to blow through. Generally, it would be here or maybe here, but I'm going to bring him here. I'd probably think more about it if we had more time, but let's get him out actually of, oh, he was an Elcor. Oh, okay. So this is Elcor. That's attached to Army Group North. Let's go look at 18th Army Headquarters. It's only 14 of 27 right now on its command. Uh, let's go ahead and put Elcor underneath. Hold on. Let's go ahead and put Elcor. Whoops, I hit on the wrong thing. Let's make its uh, headquarters 18th Army. All right, and we don't have to pay points for that stuff anymore, which is kind of nice actually, right? Uh, and that turns them purple. All right, so they're part of our purple group here. And you see, there was already an element of Elcor up here. It's turned purple as well. Uh, we might as well move the headquarters up here because they're not going. It's not close enough for them to get support units, even with a hasty attack. Um, just to back up for a second, if you're not used to the game, support units are committed if the divisions attacking. In this case, we're the Germans. If the divisions attacking are within command range of the headquarters. What's command range? Um, well, it depends. Um, for a core headquarters, it's five hexes. How do we know that? Well, let's just click on the first infantry division. Its commander is one core, its command headquarters. It shows you it's one hex away, and it can be up to five hexes away and be in command, all right? If it's doing a deliberate attack, it will get support units based on what the general decides to do if it's within that range, okay? If it's doing a hasty attack, so if it has less than six movement points left and you have to do a hasty attack, and we can talk more about that if some of you want to, if you're really new to Grigsby Games, but if you do a hasty attack, the only way you can get support units, whether, you know, even if, even if your core headquarters is in range here, is if the core headquarters has not moved, all right? So think of deliberate attacks as being well-planned, thought-out attacks. The core headquarters had a chance to send out the support units. A hasty attack is more like an attack on the run. And so the only way that they consider that it there was enough preparation was... Uh, if the headquarters had never moved. And so the headquarters was there. It wasn't moving on its own. All right, that's the basic concept. Now, that does remind me of something we haven't talked about yet. There are now prep points in this game. There is also now assault. You can have certain headquarters that are assault headquarters 
We'll get into that in a future episode. I don't want it to do do it today, uh, just not yet, because I would rather actually do a full attack for the first time in this game. Now, where are we going to do it? I think we're going to hit the fortified unit here. Usually you can hit those with a hasty. Uh, you see the usual hasty symbol. Now, there are symbols next to it there. All right, and it, you see in the pop-up here, um, climate light woods poor roads attack cv defensive cv wow it really shows you everything um air recon that we have over this so it gives you the detection level right there the fort level soviet control what it is um can i bring anything else from further back i can actually why don't we do that i always play from back to front oh this is also a member of elcor so that's nice We'll move that up to the front, okay? But we have this unit stuck back here. This is 58th Infantry Division. It's behind the river. I, like I said, I play back to front, uh, and so I always move the units in the back, or I try to, you know, within reason. Uh, I try to play them first. So this is part of 38th Corps, all right? Who else is part of 38th Corps? Anyone? anyone i guess we could find out right here you see it's commanding two of a possible nine that means it only commands one division that would be the division it's stacked with right now okay uh good to know let's click on that let's move it across the river um i generally like to attack with the units that have the least amount of now its headquarters has not moved so let's go back to that headquarters it can send support units. So let's go over to assigned. Let's assign support units. We see kind of the same selection here. Uh, heavy Werfers, I don't think we need to get that strong. Not yet, not yet. Um, I'm now not going to put these motorized mixed flak in because I want those with the panzers since they're motorized. All right, we're not going to give it any support units. I don't even think we need them anyway. We'll go to the 58th infantry division and we'll launch our first attack of the war and here we can pause for a second this menu's changed you see the attack odds 168 to 1 and they just surrendered uh hey good choice i like that um you see our raw combat value here 119 after it went through, you know, uh, the, the chef in the kitchen made the soup, it came out on the other side at 168 based on every factor, dice rolls, terrain, what it is, where it's moving, where it's, everything. It came out at 168. We attacked with 16, almost 17,000 men, 200 gun, no armored fighting vehicles. Uh, we did send 14 fighters as air cover there, okay? We captured, in this surrender, 434 men and six guns. Now, you may say, why is that only 434? They surrendered. And this came up in War in the East 1, which is, the idea is they kind of melt into the populace. Uh, they hide. They become partisans. They Other things maybe happen to them. All we know is we uh, captured 434 of them, but that unit no longer exists. It's, uh, it's gone. So they surrendered. That's that. Uh, this is the fort level, I believe. And we took it down to a zero. Yes. All right. Moving on. How are you guys doing in chat? I've been, uh, I've been focused here. So I, I don't know what's going on. You guys might be getting crazy. Uh, I doubt with it. Attack with the security unit. That's always a good idea, New Chaotic Order. That is true. Uh, yes, they do become partisans. They got the heck out of there. We could move the security unit up and attack uh, fortified units. Maybe we'll do it there. That's an idea. Let's actually do move that up. Uh, thanks, New Chaotic Order. You always have ni very nice comments. Very detailed. You are a detail-oriented man, assuming you are a man. Um... And I like it. I like that. I meant that as a compliment. Seriously. Uh, all right. We've got one Corps and 18th Army there. We've got 38th Corps there. Now what do we want to do? 
let's move the unit we just attacked with forward. Oh, wait a minute. Who is this? Who are they with? 23rd Corps. Oh, 23rd Corps is all the way down here. One other thing I wanted to look at, sometimes I'll bring these units north. Um, oh, wow. 42nd Corps starts very oversubscribed. Now, in War in the East 1, these are all part of 9th Army at the start. Here, they're attached to OKH. They must have done some research and said that they had this wrong, um, that this was actually directly attached to OKH and not to 9th Army. That's interesting, so that's a change. It's oversubscribed, so we'll have to move maybe this division out of there and give it to somebody else, or this division. We'll probably give it to somebody in 9th Army. We'll make that determination. Let's also move back here as we're starting the game and see... Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah, this really this map really does go all the way back. Um, what is this? This is uh, the main OKL. This is the main air headquarters. You're likely never going to move this or do anything with it. Oh, gosh. It's old uh, Goering there, is it not? It's, it looks like a pic picture of him. Um, interesting. Okay, well, this wasn't in the previous game, but it's just going to sit there. Uh, that is Berlin, right? Yeah, the overall air headquarters is just going to sit there. I was just looking back here to make sure there are no units that I haven't missed, just since I've never played this before, obviously. And it doesn't look like it. I don't see anything anyway. Looks like they're all kind of near the front. So we'll eventually, I think, transfer these into 9th Army. We're not going to... Eh, there's a possibility we could put them up into 18th, but I really don't want to do that until I get a better lay of the land. Now this, though, what about these guys? 254th, part of 23rd Corps. Tw 23rd Corps is just part of Army Group North. It's not part of... 16th Army. All right, let's look at the headquarters for 16th Army really fast. They're commanding 16 of 27, so they could take this on. If we wanted uh, them to be with 16th, they could also go with 18th. Huh. Well, I think we should do one or the other. There's no reason to have this... Sit, uh, where is it? Where is it? Where to go? Where'd your core headquarters go? It says, Oh, it's right there. 23rd Corps, there's no reason for that to go all the way up to Army Group North. You're missing a possible dice roll to beat uh, a test. And so let's reassign that. Now, do we want it in 16th or 18th? I think I want it in 18th. Um... That works. It's still underneath its uh, command number, the 18th Army is. There it is, 18th Army. It's now up to 24 of 27 units. I say units that it command. Divisions count as two, two points. So this would be 12 divisions. If there are regiments or battalions or brigades that are on the map, they count one point. So like these regiments down here, uh, you can tell they're regiments by the the, ha the three hashes. Um, it's the one one sixty second infantry division, but it's been split into three, so they're they're like regiments. They count one point. Divisions count two. If you're not familiar with the game, okay. So we put these guys in 18th Army. Why are we going to do that? Because we're going to really try to blow this thing wide open up here. Um, but the best way to do that is by the way this right here is their prep score you start the game at a hundred for all of the german divisions or i think all of them i i say that as a general rule uh what about the unit down here hold on let's move him up here first how far can he get he can only get there uh i changed my mind I changed my mind. Um, and luckily, in this game, you can change your mind. And we can go back down here in 23rd Corps. We can change this over. I put it in 18. Oh, I can't change my mind, actually. 
uh, because I've already done it. That's okay. Uh, we'll just we'll roll it this way. That's fine. This guy, let's get him up here since he's coming from the back. Let's get this unit up here. Uh, you can't quite get across the river yet. And that's not even because of triple stacking. So, jeez. You can go here, here, or here. All right. Well, I guess we got to put him in the swamp for a turn. He can't go any. Didn't want to move the headquarters. Uh, let's undo that. As I always tell people that watch the Let's Plays, make sure you've selected the unit you actually want to move. That's why we couldn't go any further. I see now. Uh, let's put him there. Oh, good. This actually does work then. This is this is sort of what I want. It's not ideal. Do I have? Yeah, this guy comes all the way from the south. And we're going to put him there. Awesome. Oh, gosh, I just did it again. And now I can't undo that. But luckily, headquarters, I'm getting used to the... Uh, I'm getting used to the interface, folks. Uh, luckily, headquarters, no big deal. This is the overall headquarters for 3rd Panzer Group. This is not a group you want to be moving uh, away from where it's taking off from. Sorry about that. Wasn't paying close enough attention. Let's move it back down here. There we go. We'll hit the space bar so it just shows up there. All right. Now then, let's get back to... Do a thing that didn't cost us didn't hurt us it was just embarrassing i'm red faced what other units then are coming out of here got to get our headquarters up here there we go let's get the headquarters we'll triple stack with headquarters for now we'll eventually move them um we could also attack with a security unit here I've already got the one unit that I moved there to attack this fortified unit, probably. Maybe this way. We'll see. Um, okay, let's jump in now. The Polizia SS Infantry Division is on the spot. Let's click on that again. For some reason, I'm having a little more difficulty with this than I usually do, but that could just be user error. Let's do a hasty attack because it's part of 23rd. 23rd headquarters has moved, so we can't get support units anyway. It just surrendered right away. 531, so that's gone. Now, I'm, I want to keep using this unit as much as I can with hasty attacks to knock out as much stuff as I can. Surrendered, routed. Okay, so we blew them out of there. Now we'll hit here. Defensive forces held. It was only 1.2 to 1. We may have missed a dice roll there. Let's try that again. I don't know what fire range means. Should I? Uh, 1 to 2.2. Well, we actually lost that battle. Okay, well, this is their strongest unit, so that's fine. Can we move him forward at all? No, that's fine. We don't want to. We're going to bypass this unit and just blow right through here. Uh, so really, I probably didn't even know to, need to go to that extent. Why don't we move him, the security unit, up to here. They're still in command range. Let's try a deliberate... Whoop, don't want to do it with the ID. I, I am struggling with that. I don't know why. I usually don't in the first game. But let's do a deliberate attack here and just see what happens. Hey, okay. Well, they surrendered and routed to our security division. That's impressive, gentlemen. Uh, I guess we'll just attack with them as much as... Well, that time... Okay, we got good generalship there. They only scouted because they said, Nope, we don't like those odds at all. While I'm here, why don't we go ahead and knock out this fortified unit. Get off there with uh, the security unit here. We'll do a hasty. They just surrendered. So all the fortified units are just surrendering on turn one. Um, right. Okay. That's part of the Panzer division. We don't want to move that yet. That's Elcor. Uh, 
I'm going to try to think how I usually do this. I've been so focused on the game, just learning the game and getting the basics of the game. I want to make sure that I'm doing everything I want to do later, because we're going to do this as a Let's Play, so we might as well do it right. Let's move this unit that has eight movement points up. Let's have them try to, well, we can get support units into Elcor, right? Assign support units. We don't have a whole lot here. That's why we're repositioning all the support units. Um, we may not need that anywhere else. Let's go ahead and let the rockets fly. Uh, and let's do... These are all motorized. Army light flak, army light flak. We'll give it a little flak just in case. I don't think the Soviets will present any kind of problem in the air, but you never know. Uh, this is a two. Oh, shoot. I guess those support units didn't matter for him. We did a hasty attack. Got 2.6 to 1. Uh, we had one unit that surrendered and one that retreated. That all sounds good to me. This unit is also an Elcor. Let's do a deliberate attack. Now we, oh, we got 15 to 1. So we got surrendered and routed. They're gone. Right. We'll probably leave this security unit here. I don't even think I'm going to attack them. I don't think there's any need to. Uh, well, I guess I can, I can bring 16th down and around this way. Why don't we take this unit... Let's take our furthest back units that we can and start carving up territory. So, this one only has nine movement points. Let's, uh, what's he part of? Actually, that's first ID. I don't want that. Let's move the Elcor. We'll just, I'm just going to kind of make this up at the fly. We'll have Elcor move to the south. Does that make sense? How many people does Elcor have? Only two divisions. They're both right here. All right, so the 86 we'll have there to seal off. We'll start making the corridor. Where's Elcor? Okay, it's the Polizia. Stay selected. Uh, well, I wish I could get him a little further, to be honest with you. I think to do that, I need to knock that unit out. So maybe I will move this part of 23rd Corps up. Does that make sense? <clears throat> I've got to get my head on straight here, folks. What about this part of 23rd Corps? Okay, 23rd Corps can start making it up this way. One Corps, 23rd Corps. He's got 10. All right, let's move him. All right, there he goes. Now, 23rd Corps, I can't remember. Did we have support units in here not really we don't have any to give we could do a motorized brigade but i'm gonna like i said i'm gonna put those in with the panzers let's do he can be the base of this structure i think what else does he have 23rd core 23rd oh this could be the base really all right let's do a hasty attack and just try to knock him back here well we got 24 to 1 so he routed out that was all ado about nothing. Um, what do we have there? Oh, that just disappeared. Oh, okay. So we're going to do this with 23rd Corps. Can he move at all? Oh, yeah, he can move one more. So we'll move him there. Now, this part of 23rd Corps can really get moving up here this is where this is where we're going to drive our panzers um let's just do a hasty attack i'm going to do that eventually anyway let's just get it out of the way now then do we go attack this unit or do we just try to get as far as we can i think i'm gonna go ahead We've already cut the rail there now. I think I'll go here. Hasty attack. 3.6 to 1. We routed the armored unit. All right. Um, then we'll go up here and scatter it. All right. So that's 23rd. Now, I don't want anybody to get out of command this early. That may have moved him a little far, to be honest with you. 
Uh, so there's 23rd Corps. He can move up here and sit directly with his division. Everybody's on side. That works for me. All right. Now, do we have anybody else that can come over here and attack besides what's obvious? Um, I could just, you know, hit him with that. But, gosh, I hate to waste. I think if I'm going to quote-unquote waste points like that, I'm just going to do it with this one unit. Surrender. Uh, that's 462 men. I think... I think he can take that unit out with a hasty. Surrendered and routed. Uh, let's hit that one. All right, let's just get rid of them all. I will say these are falling much easier than they do in one. Uh, usually you just kind of surround the hard ones, but we've completely cleared them out. So let's take this unit and go as far as we can up the uh, west coast here. And I ain't talking about the west coast of America, folks. We're here on the Baltic. Uh, we'll hit there. Now, if you just look at the map and we kind of pull back, here's all the swamp. So we need the panzers either to go this way or up this way. And we're carving a path up here with as many, you know, to save them as many movement points as possible. We're carving this path. We'll just keep going and hitting what we can. We got another one in. That that one held. All right, that's fine. Now then, who else is part of your unit? It's the 26th. This is 26th, right? No, it's directly attached to the 18th Army. Well, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah, that's Wadrig. He's not great. He's not terrible. I mean, the Soviets would die to have a general with these stats, but yeah, he's a little over a five. He's pretty pretty average for the Germans. Um, he's part of 26th Corps. So this is his guy. Who else does he command? Let's click on him. Okay, not sure if that helped me decide what I'm going to do. Let's click off that. Let's go up here to 26 Corps, and let's take it as far north as we can. Like this, though. Let's Actually, let's go rub this unit and see what's going on. Okay, it's not much. Let's try to blow that away. It routed. All right, I, I guess I'm just going to take these as far north as I can, actually. Um, let's go ahead and hit a hasty attack there. Okay, they held a little bit better defense there. We really don't even need to deal with this. We've got them. We're going to get them cut off here in a second. We could surround them, even, potentially, if we really wanted to. I'll let the Panzers deal with that. So we're just going to going to. It's too far away. I, I like them to be spaced every other one. All right. So that looks pretty promising. We can bring the headquarters up here a little bit. A little bit further. All right. So now they're on side. Now who is he with again? He's with twenty third. Okay. That is 23rd. He also commands there. And that's his headquarters. All right, I'm just trying to get this straight in my head. This guy is not attached to anyone. Uh, we could move the headquarters over here and attach him and just have this kind of our, our force out here. Okay, let's put him in 23rd. 18th Army right now, but we want him in... 23rd Corps, all right, that works. So now that's his headquarters. We'll move this headquarters over here a little bit so that everybody in, gosh darn it, I keep doing that. 
so that everybody is within command range here. All right, so that works perfectly. This is the 23rd. They're going to kind of hold our western side. Uh, the 26th is here. Anybody else? 26th, 26th? I don't believe so. We saw them all, right? Yep, yeah, 26th. Okay. Now then, uh, what else do we want to do here? Elcor. What do we want to do with Elcor? Let's work with them first. Ecclesia. We can't go very far. We may just drive him kind of straight forward. This is the other part of Elcor. Here's the headquarters for Elcor. That's it. He's only got those two units. That's fine. Now then, we can... Now, remember, 16th Army is going to carve all of this area up. Now, uh, we're going to drive one core of the Panzers this way, of 4th Panzer, and the other core this way. We don't really have to attack anything here. It's going to be completely surrounded. So don't spend your time sitting there thinking how am i going to get around all these guys you don't really have to do that uh, because 16th army is going to start moving this way now i will take a panzer and cut this rail line or disrupt it uh, so they can't move this way uh, but that's all we really need to remember to do let's take this let's take these guys as far north as we can i feel like this is a lot further than you can go in one but hey we hit that one Army Depot is captured. Hey, this is new stuff. Anti-tank brigade routed. We knocked everything the crap out of here. What is that? Uh, Nogava? That probably was not pronounced correctly. Uh, 48th and then one core. We haven't moved one core yet. Oh, yeah, we have. That is one core. So that's modal. All right. Um, I think I'm just going to surround them. I'm not too worried about what they're up to. Thinking about carving up more territory for the Panzers. Let's just get him as far north as we can. That works. We'll have Lodal, Mo, Lodal, Modal lead the charge. And we'll bring this other unit up here and cut the rail to the extent. I mean, they can still go up and out here, but hopefully we'll get, uh, we should get a Panzer division up here. So that won't be very successful, likely. There's Volter Modal. We'll bring him up here. Try to keep him five back so he's as close to the railhead as possible. It's not really that important. We'll actually just stack him with this infantry unit. Ah, I, miss, I moved both of them. Bad me. I'm going to have to start checking that a lot closer. Now, we are going to come over here as we play the game and talk about supply priorities, set assault, what the heck that means, combat report straight out of this, what all of this means. For now, I just thought it would be fun if we moved around and actually did something since it's our first time through the game. Uh, right, okay, that all works. That Soviet unit, they are these units will not be able to get through here. We've got zone of control, two full German divisions. You know what, let's just hit them with a hasty tack again and see what we see. Hey, and you know what, we just routed them out. I wasn't even gonna move this anyway, so that works well. Oh, okay. Those were all units that had routed before, so we scatter them to the wind. We've got one more unit back here, part of the 28th. Uh, the 28th, the 28th. Oh, this is the one that's all by itself. Well, I kind of wish I would have used this to do something else, but that's all right. Uh, we're going to put that here. Scattered that. All right. That all looks good. We'll just move the headquarters up a little bit and 18th army is already on the right side of the river i think i'll just i'll move it up to memel 
there's no good reason for that. I'm just OCD. So I'm going to put it in memo. Makes more sense to me. Uh, as we back up, you can see that just looks that looks a lot like our World War or uh, War in the East one type of map. We've moved 18th up here. We're heading towards Riga. Uh, 16th now will fan out here and do the southern portion of it. Then we'll take Panzer, one core of it this way, one core of it that way, or uh, there may be three cores in total. Um, but we will deal with that then. There are railroad units, dedicated railroad units. Here it is, FBD4. Let's get it up here to the front. Now, where do we want that to go? I'm going to turn roads off just so I'm making sure we're getting this just right. Okay, there we go. Now we can really see the railway. Uh, there he is. These are already all repaired, of course. We could go up here. Now, I wish I would have cleared that hex. We can't go this way. When it says yellow, it's next to a Soviet-controlled hex, and you can't go that way. Um, just keep that in mind. Coffee break, Phantom. Actually, you know what? Before I move this rail unit, I'm going to call this an episode two hours in. We're going to keep playing the game uh, when I come back tonight. I'm going to go get some chips and salsa, some tacos. It is Taco Tuesday. I always celebrate Taco Tuesday. Uh, I will have a very uh, angry, no, she's not an angry person, but uh, my wife, I think, will be getting hungry, and all of you husbands out there know that that is never good. So I think I'm going to go grab something to eat, um, and then I'll come back a little bit later and we will keep, you know, going on. We'll keep plugging along. We'll talk about each of these concepts as we continue to play the game. I do think it's the best way to learn the game. I will eventually make a tutorial for it, but let's keep playing the game. We still need to talk about depots. Uh, we need to talk about this new concept of assault uh, and designating certain units as a salt uh, units. Uh, we can talk about that. We'll continue to talk about the air war. Now, if we look at the losses screen, and you can see here, uh, Soviet losses, is this? Yeah, air combat on the ground. The Soviets lost 2,500 or so. As the turn progresses, that'll go a little over 3,000, maybe quite a bit over 3,000 as they try to interdict or they try to somehow bomb us uh, on turn one. This is much lower than you would typically get in War in the East 1. I mean, when that game first came out, you could get like six or 7,000. That was totally unrealistic, really, I think. Um, then it became more like 4,000 was kind of normal. Here, we let the AI do it all. These were the direct AI air directives. And so we're sitting at 2,500 now with 322 losses. I said during the War in the East tutorial that I think it's the most overrated part of the game, how many aircraft you destroy on turn one. That being said, I just kind of want to compare the AI and whether I do want to start giving manual AI directives. I think we will. It's a better way to learn the game, right? So we'll go out and start doing that. Uh, but that all awaits in the future. We are finally playing War in the East 2, and I couldn't be happier about it. I hope you guys really enjoyed this episode. I know I had a blast. That's for sure. I had a great time. Uh, the chat was good. Sorry I didn't talk as much as I usually do to the chat. Uh, I was a little more focused this time because I'm just try I'm trying to learn some things along with you. Uh, since it is a new game system to me as well. So anyway, thank you guys so much. I really appreciate the support. Subscribe, comment, like. Don't hit the down like, but you can leave me a nasty comment in the comments if you if you don't like tacos or whatever the case may be or how I moved one of these divisions. Anyway, thank you guys again. Strategic, <laughs> strategic, strategic dojo. I'm just going to close with that. Have a good one. I'll talk to you next time.